Okay, well, I'm actually going to get Clem to start us off. Uh, hello everybody. Um, first of all, I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands we meet on today um, and to those that are listening to this um, presentation today. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Clem Laurie. I'm a uh, traditional owner from the Nullarbor region of uh, far west South Australia and, and Western Australia. The South Australian side is part of the Far West Coast um, determination. Um, we manage um, the Nullarbor parks um, from within that uh, claim of the determination. So I've been working on this um, land management stuff uh, in a pre-native title, um, um, lobbying way back then to the government about you know, protecting um, far West Coast regions, and um, it's been a long, hard slog, but um, um, you can see that you know the achievements are, are happening, and um, you know I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the Far West Coast and what we've, uh, how far we've come and what we've achieved. It's, it really is a good, um, good story out there. Hi everyone, um, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, country we meet on is uh, Ghana country and uh, always has and always will be and I'm paying my respects to their connection to country and the special land we meet on today. Um, my name is Matthew Ward, I'm Executive Director for Conservation and Land Management in the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. Um, it's a fairly diverse uh, group that uh, I oversee but uh, part of it is protected areas and park management, park management policy and co-management. <coughs> is uh, from a central a policy uh, agency point of view is run out of protected areas and uh, has been linked with uh, native title negotiations as far back as 2004 and even earlier um, and I'm also lucky enough to sit on three co-management boards. I co-chair Nullarbor and Numbra co-management boards and also Brackway's co-management board up in Cooper PD. So that's me. My name is Wanda Wood. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge um, the traditional owners, the Ghana people, and where we meet today on this land. Um, I'm also from the far west. I live at uh, a small community called Scodesco. Um, it's a small family owned land, um, about 100 km west of Sejuna. So I say I live on the edge of the Nullarbor Plain. Our committee was on the ABC News and Australia wide a few weeks ago. We are growing salt bush and we hope to produce and develop new markets for stock feed and also human consumption as salt bush is high in protein and gluten free. As added bonus, salt bush produces carbon credit, it improves and regenerates the soil, so it's really um, good um, green green um, and clean energy out there. Um, and I'm, I'm really um, proud of that, that uh, you know, it's um, helping the environment and not um, something we put in there that will fight the environment. So it's natural. I am passionate about keeping our culture strong and making sure that our cultural knowledge is passed on to our young people. Thanks, Wanda. Um, my name is Saris and I'm just going to do a very brief introduction into co-management in South Australia. So most of you would be familiar with Uru and um, joint management, probably the most famous jointly managed park um, in Australia. In South Australia we have a, a, a different model. Um, instead of handing back on condition that the, the park gets leased back to the government, we actually start um, with an advisory committee. So about 70% of the area of South Australia's parks are actually under co-management arrangements. So the yellow, light green yellow areas um, 
like these are all um, co-managed areas that have <coughs> advisory committees and these advisory committees are usually how we start our co-management arrangements where we have an advisory committee that has four traditional owners or native title holders and four government um, staff or sometimes a community member as well on that committee and they advise the director of national parks. Then the, kind of the brownie, orangey coloured ones are um, co-management boards and that's where they actually take on, the board takes on the role and responsibilities of the director of national parks in making sure that the parks are managed um, for things like making sure that biodiversity conservation and public access. And so then the red ones, which is um, Kanku Breakaways and Mamanari, the way out west, um, they're actually Aboriginal owned land, so that's Aboriginal owned parks with a majority Aboriginal board. So the model in South Australia is that we, we negotiate a co-management arrangement, usually alongside native title, but it has a, and can be done outside of that, and usually start with building capacity within government in order to be able to work appropriately with um, Aboriginal communities and traditional owners, so that we learn how how they want to manage their land and build our capacity, but also to build the capacity within um, traditional owners and Aboriginal communities to use contemporary park management techniques. So it's about growing, developing the relationship and growing together. So we're using both traditional knowledge and um, contemporary techniques to manage those parks. So, the, the other thing that's happened is that this is the Anjara Willara Natural Resources region in the far west and north of South Australia and it's the only Aborig full Aboriginal NRM board in the country and they said we want to empower our communities and we want the plan that we have and the work that gets done to be directed by the community. How do we do this? So they, they looked for a system and, and decided that the best way to do that would to have each community to develop its own plan, a healthy country plan, and that each community would have that and then that would direct the work that happens. So um, Clem and Wanda, who are from the far west of South Australia, so this is the um, native title determination area that also goes into the next NRM region. They've decided that the majority of the area is actually park. So they decided that they wanted to use this healthy country plan and use the process where they develop the plans to produce their own healthy country plan, which goes, which they put whatever they think is important in there, and use that information also to develop the park management plans as well. Okay, so what I'm now now provided that introduction, we're actually going to do a, a bit of a Q&A about some of the key issues um, between the four of us. There will actually be some um, photographs in the background of country and some of the animals and also the people who've been involved and the people of that country as well. So I'll just remember how to do that. So this was actually one of um, the first on-country workshop that we had out on the Nullarbor at Canal de Homestead. So Clem, oh sorry, Wanda, the first question is for you. So the Far West Native Title Determination was a significant day um, for Far West Coast people and your traditional rights were finally recognised. What does co-management of parks give you beyond your native title rights? It gives us the right to practice cultural activities on conservation and parklands, the right to manage and make decisions on these lands, and the acknowledgement by the government of the deep connections traditional owners have to these lands and the success of the co-management board to eventuate into the transfer of total management and responsibility of these parks to the traditional owners on behalf of all Thanks, Wanda. Uh, Wanda, you're co 
Local management has provided Far West Coast people with more opportunities. Can you explain a, a bit about what opportunities there are now? Yeah, I think that um, because we're, we're right in there, we're part of the process, we're actually driving the, the works out on, uh, on country. Even though we're not physically there, we, we direct where, you know, what works can happen and, and where. Um, but we get a lot of researchers out that, um, that go into caves and, and do um, uh, you know, research and stuff and that and there. And um, there's a permit process where the um, um, researchers have to apply for, to go out there and we put conditions on those, on those permits. Um, one of the conditions is to have um, TOs out there when they're doing their, their work and, and that's, that's been very successful. Um, the other things we, um, we do is a lot of Far West Coast people have been involved in on-ground works out there and maintenance of the infrastructure with, with the national parks, um, which is good, which is, um, you know, leads to employment and training in, in certain areas. Um, the other big thing that we're going to be um, looking into is the tourism side of things, um, especially with the government's nature-based tourism strategy. Um, it gives us that that option of um, um, you know, economic development and employment for our people. So um, there are a couple of the um, things where you know, our people are benefiting um, from uh, works and, and things out there. And there was another one that I had, but I've <laughs> opportunity. Yeah, that was the the, the on-ground uh, works with. National parks and um, um, the researchers. Uh, one more, I can't remember what it was. Um, yeah, but um, I'm sure you get the the idea there. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's good. Actually, the next question's for you, Matt. It's around so. Um, so why haven't we just gone to a have that situation um, when during the title negotiations? Yeah, asked the very difficult questions front up. Um, so uh, co-management does get born out of native title negotiations um, and uh, it recognises and the state government recognising and the Department of Environment recognising um, that um, within a reconciliation agenda that disconnection from country is really um, it was recognising that disconnection that's happened through dispossession and um, it's actually an avenue to reconnect people back with their country. And so I'd say front up that there is absolutely a um, priority of the government department to use co-management as an avenue to reconnect traditional owners with their country. Um, in terms of why we don't necessarily just go to full handback, I guess there is that recognition from the government that the parks there are for a broader public resource. Um, and they have been uh, managed in a certain way within more recent times and there is the contemporary frameworks that we have around uh, legalities and, and various things and access to a whole range of people so <coughs> where we're probably um, trying to aim for in the, in the medium term is to try and um, partner with uh, traditional owners, native title owners to um, manage those parks, but absolutely open to further discussion down the track around what the future might actually look like. But there are certain, um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a middle ground in the early piece in terms of how we manage those parks, but we're very interested and in, I think one of the key challenges is recognising um, that the way that um, we have managed parks in the past hasn't necessarily been the right way as well. And so it's around, through that process, learning from traditional owners learning from Wanda and Clem, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to um, seek from them advice as to how they would potentially manage the park. And, and part of that is the government letting go of the traditional conservation agenda and thinking about how native plants, native animals, and traditional use of parks might be intertwined to contemporary park management around biodiversity and conservation as well. So, yeah. 
Thanks, Matt. So, Clem, one of the first tasks that you've had um, as a, you know, a board and committee member is to develop the park management plan. So, can you tell me what was special about that planning process that maybe is, is different from other processes? <laughs> Yeah, no, we've, ever since getting our determination in 2013, um, we've been very active um, in, in setting up and developing management plans for the park. Um, one of the things is um, we've had, you know, the right consultants and the right support from the staff um, um, guiding us in that, in that um, area. And um, one of the... Um, Special things also is we go out into country and do on country workshops, um, and we find that's a better way of taking out um, our people um, because you know you can sit down in Sojourn or Adelaide and make plans and things like that, but it's it's not the same as actually being out on country and going out and seeing special places um, over the time that you're out there. So that's that's one of the special things about it as well. So, Matt, this planning process has been a, um, a significant commitment by the government. Why do you think the government is so committed and putting a lot of resources into this process? I think more broadly it's, it's a commitment to true consultation by the government and where government's going in terms of better together and uh, engaging communities from the outset to uh, not only develop plans but to solutions around complex issues that government generally deals with. Um, in context of these park management plans, traditionally park management planning has been brought out of a fairly rigorous process which might take uh, anywhere between one, two to twelve years. Previously for Yellowbinna, before code management, there was probably a process of around twelve years to develop a management plan which actually never even got over the line. It was a very detailed management plan as to what you would do, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, on a yearly cycle almost, and a great compendium of information that actually sits there, but it's, it doesn't actually assist us to manage um, parks with traditional owners. And so out of co-management, there was recognition from the department and recognition of people within the Allen Jada Woodorado NRM region that we wanted to do park management planning in a different way, and one which actually was tenure blind. So we have certain planning mechanisms for NRM regions as a whole, also have park management planning and they didn't necessarily talk to each other and so there was a decision made to try and use a similar process for both broader landscape stuff for open natural whole natural resource management regions and for individual parks and so we saw the healthy country planning process which is a world leading process which uses cultural hierarchies does the planning on park um, listens to traditional owners they tell us you know who should be on working groups so it uses those um, cultural governance mechanisms to go about that planning process and so there was a real genuine commitment from the department to let go and so much of this is about letting go and when you come to a set of priorities as we have done um, out of Skidesco and as a government employee to look back and go wow um, co-management board uh, representatives and the working group came up with those priorities it's actually incredibly empowering to know that um, the community has come up with those and we're there to support the community to do those and, um, doesn't mean there's not challenges, doesn't mean that we're not partnered to achieve those priorities. However, there's a sense of empowerment across everyone that has been done jointly, I think, and, and from the from the hearts and minds of the traditional owners. Thanks, Matt. And Wanda, um, what was most important to you about the planning? Well, um, like Matt said, there have been plans and plans made um, before native title. Um, but this plan, um, we were anticipating to be something much more um, valuable to the Aboriginal people. And, and as soon as we started, um, we were, you know, a bit sceptical. Um, but then as we went on, um, we could feel the change. Uh, that Aboriginal people were not only being included, but the facilitator and the natural resource management staff showed uh, genuine respect and openness 
to really listen and be guided by our views and, and for all of us to learn from each other and a two-way learning, learning process. And this enthusiasm and respect has continued ever since. Every meeting, a natural resource meeting and healthy country planning meeting since uh, we started have been really positive meetings. Um, and you know, um, earlier today we talk, uh, heard about um, openness and um, transparency and um, you know, the program that we um, heard today. Uh, that's already happening in, in our um, co-management and um, advisory boards with natural resource management and the government. But there's still a, a ways to go, because, um, you know, we, we've been um, led um, by the government of the days since um, settlement. And so it's hard, you know, over 200 years for the government to really let everything just go at, at once. There's still a process we're going through, but we can see, you know, at the way forward. Um, and, you know, we're really um, um, enthusiastic about it. Um, and I also see um, a huge positive input this has had on our people. They have grown in their confidence, their knowledge um, being valued, um, pride in our culture, and, and what is being achieved so far. So it's a real positive um, um, process that we're going through on the far west. We might be right on the edge at uh, out west, where we have previously been forgotten, but. Uh, but uh, we're making changes. Thanks, Wanda. Matt, what are some of the challenges um, we faced as government in implementing co-management? I think that letting go is a major challenge. And I think the other one which um, we regularly uh, discuss at co-management board meetings is the recognition of people's knowledge of country and how we do that within contemporary governance frameworks and commissioner standards, etc. etc. And um, Wanda mentioned previously um, to the previous speaker around recognition of that traditional knowledge, and I think we've yet to really um, capture that um, within government and within the department to actually reflect that because then that would then transfer down to how we might actually look to manage parks actually different, differently. Um, probably a little bit more detail, but the relationship between the um, Native Title Group, uh, the Co-Management Boards and the Department, um, there's a three-way triangle there and the communication and roles and responsibilities between those three groups is really critical to be clear on in order to um, allow the process we need to do for park management, such as getting the park management plans up, making decisions under the National Parks and Wildlife Act, who has those delegations, some of that information, absolutely, we could probably decide around the co-management board table, but there's some things which we can't tell and we won't be able to ever be aware of that traditional owners need to consult more probably with their, um, with their elders, so with the native title group as well, and so um, we can't think that we're going to go into a park management process where it will just roll out as per normal. There's a bit of um, give and take that needs to happen there and probably uh, different time frames. So. Just a couple of the channels. Thanks, Matt. And Wanda, um, what about some of the challenges you found from a traditional owner perspective? The most um, important challenge um, I could see for um, for government to uh, acknowledge and recognise um, is, um, you know. Do, uh, giving away uh, all those powers, um, and especially uh, what bugs me all the time is uh, the um, lack of recognition in the knowledge and um, um, what we can contribute, our values, our values as um, Aboriginal people and our culture, and, and you know, the rich. Um, um, culture values that um, um, 
Aboriginal people bring. It's not recognised in, um, you know, the, uh, in the outside view of um, uh, white Australia, I guess, um, because even in teaching, um, you know, if you teach um, um, cultural awareness, if I got up and, which I have, uh, you know, presented cultural awareness, um, um, I would be looked at um, as somebody without, um, you know, I didn't have a piece of paper to, to um, run a cultural awareness or facilitate one. Um, because it's not recognised yet in the um, in educational um, accreditations. Um, but my um, experience and values come right back, and I can't see very many people left these days who come from a background of being born out bush, being brought up um, till I was about five, six years old, totally in my culture, immersed totally robberies, hunting and gathering and surviving. I've, you know, I've never come across someone like that. Um, it's very rare. You do see some people, especially in the outlying countryside. And, um, you know, I was put in the children's home when I was about five years old and I couldn't speak English. I had to learn that at school. But since then, you know, I had to live this white fellow's way and conform like that to be able to survive. Um, but you know, I think I'm, I'm qualified. Nobody else might think that about talking about my culture. I still, um, I live in a house, but I still go hunting and gathering. I go hunting for sleepy lizards. I, I go shooting um, um and cooking it and doing all those cultural stuff. Um, but I'm getting way, way late now. <laughs> um, I'll just check on that. <laughs> okay. So what was the answer? A question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was really talking about the, the government recognising the value that Aboriginal um, people have and the knowledge they've got. There's no value, you know, you, in other areas of learning, people have a piece of paper to say they've done this and done that. And so it's recognised readily in the wider Australian communities. But um, it's not recognised um, readily, the knowledge of Aboriginal people um, with their culture. And what's out there, you know, uh, it's the plants um, and all those things. Um, and so, um, you know, that's not acknowledged. Um, if, um, well, I used to sit on, um, uh, the, um, years ago, on um, Parks and Wildlife, it was called, the National Parks and Wildlife Committee, and I was on the board representing Aboriginal interests, but I was sitting on the board of all these um, people who were um, expert in the area, you know, so soil board, water board, and all those things. And it was truly intimidating. Um, but I sat there for my people. I can be stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, um, uh, was, um, got a, a, a certificate or a badge um, for five years on the board. Um, but the, the recognition of our, our knowledge and our culture needs, that's the big hurdle that we have to overcome and give credit where credit is due. Because I feel a little bit like we're being used to tell you the truth. Um, and you know, because when they get other experts, people who come there, they pay them as consultants. Um, but it's not, it's not um, recognised that Aboriginal people uh, have you know, that value in, in our knowledge. Um. I think that is one of the big challenges for us is actually in a Western system where you're, you know, 
your university degree or whatever piece of paper is acknowledged and that's the way we value things is that how do we actually value this, you know, gen generations and generations of knowledge which they hold. How do we, how do we find people like you, Wanda? How do we find people like you? <laughs> I'm going to getting on in years too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, I'll just maybe, Claire, if you just maybe say a final couple of words around um, some, you know, key things that you would like to share with people on engaging with Aboriginal communities, and then we'll um, take some questions from the floor. Um, I didn't quite understand that thing, but um, yeah, no. Look, um, personally, I think um, you know one of the one of the people like Wanda has been around for um, a long time, pre-native title, we've been part of this process. Um, is is the positiveness that comes out of it that we're actually at the table, we're driving, um, you know, works on the parks. We're 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 right in there. It's only getting better. And um, uh, personally, and I speak for a lot of my people, it has it is changed Aboriginal people's lives. The community now is more aware of what's happening within their lands and, and um, you know, all that stuff. So um, it's really good. Um, I think we were a good example out west, um, the way that we've um, achieved um, things to this day. So yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. And I, I, Really happy with the, the staff of the, the, the National Parks and the AW staff. They've been so supportive and so um, respectful that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. We're not only looking after the parks for Aboriginal people, it's for everyone. Everyone is uh, inclusive. And um, long as they do the right thing when they go to the parks, but it's, it's um, for everyone to enjoy. Thanks very much, um, Wanda.